Playback experiments like these open the way to understanding the language of birdsong. High quality recordings of bird songs are necessary for revealing their astonishing complexity, which can hardly be imagined unless they're displayed visually. And only then, when they're slowed down. Even the brief conqueree of the red-winged blackbird contains an unexpected richness, but it's nothing to the slowed down winter wren song. Why should a bird song be so complex? Can a bird really have this much to say? Bruce Falls used his playback method to try to pick the song apart and look for the hidden message within it. He started by trying to find out what parts of the song were important in species recognition. And the way we did that was to alter songs, just cutting the tapes up with scissors and putting them back together in different ways or leaving pieces out or putting pieces in, uh, to see if we could change the song in some way so that the bird didn't respond as strongly. And if we observed that, then we felt that we had interfered with something that was essential to recognition of their own species. Taking bird songs apart and putting them back together in a different way while keeping track of what you're doing isn't easy. One scientist to try is Professor Stephen Emlin, here working at the Laboratory of Ornithology at Cornell University. I first became interested in the approach of using artificial or modified songs in playback experiments as a result of hearing Bruce Falls give a paper at a scientific meeting. I'd been studying a bird called the indigo bunting as a part of doing some migration studies, studying their navigational systems, and as a part of this I'd gotten quite intrigued by their singing behavior, particularly by the fact that each individual indigo bunting has a repertoire of only one song type, so that day after day, throughout the entire breeding season, the bird sings only one song, and he sings it thousands and thousands of times. The fact that the indigo bunting sings only one song makes it ideal for the experiment. The indigo bunting song is usually described as a series of notes, which are given in pairs, so that one is repeated almost exactly a second time. Then the bird goes on to sing another note, repeat it, and well, listen to it here. It's hard to really uh, hear very much because the bird sings at a very rapid rate and the actual fine structure of what the bird is singing, the individual notes or figures as they're called, actually is too fast for the human ear to follow. So let me slow this down and uh, play it for you at one quarter speed and you can hear both the pairing and some of the fine structure of the individual song figures or notes. Supposing you think of, of these individual notes, or a series of notes, like a sentence, so that each note represents one word. If you had a sentence like, the bird flew to the tree, one thing you might do is rearrange those words to come up with a new sentence. And it might sound like a nonsense sentence, like, the tree too flew the bird. The question is, would that be a nonsense sentence to the bird if we were doing a song playback? I've taken exactly the same song you just heard, and have modified the tape by splicing so that now all the words or the notes have been reshuffled so that none come together into a pair. Let me again play it at a quarter speed. And let's try and follow this at a quarter speed. So 
so there you have a song which has been unpaired artificially. And the question, of course, is whether the bird will still respond to it as the same song or whether he'll respond the way we did when I mentioned this scrambled sentence. To find out, Emlyn invades an indigo bunting's territory with his tape recorder and a rather large army surplus loudspeaker. The indigo bunting is a tiny eastern United States songbird with a liking for tall trees. If Emlyn has scrambled a song so much that the bird can't recognize it as an indigo bunting song, it will ignore it. Bird's singing way over here. Here's my artificial playback. But if the doctored tape still retains the message, I'm an indigo bunting, the bird should go into action. Here comes the bird in. He's in the top of the tree. And there he's in a buzz flight. There's a full buzz flight. He's got fluffed, his tail's arched. He's right up over the speaker. The speaker's between these two trees. He'll probably fly over. What the bird's doing when he's in this buzz and quiver like this, the bird is essentially so upset that it's inhibited from directly attacking the speaker. It's as though he's got, he's incorporated both fear as well as the tendency to attack. Here he's buzzing, essentially going right over, localizing the, the speaker on the ground. There he's coming. Full buzz flight. The reason I call them buzz flights is he usually gives that buzz note right at the end of such a flight. That's one very upset bird at the moment. By doing this, I was able to find out that the scrambling, taking the notes of the song and rearranging them in different orders, even if I randomized the order of the notes, that the birds would still come in and give a full response. They'd come in, they'd do the buzz flight, they'd come around and land and attack the speaker. An entire response, just as though I had not modified the song at all. In other words, interestingly, the feature that humans respond to, namely the pairing of the notes, appears to be of quite minor importance to the birds themselves, at least of minor importance as far as this conveyance of information about recognition of a species is concerned. So what is it about the song of the indigo bunting that allows buntings to recognize it? Emlyn splice tapes every imaginable way, changing the timing, the pitch, the rate, the order, the length, the song quality. Most times, the buntings he checked the tapes with still reacted as though there was a real invader, except when he changed the time intervals between the notes and when he eliminated the song's harsher notes. Some work that Bruce Falls has done with the white-throated sparrow shows that the timings in their song is important too, but the white throat seemed to recognize pitch more than note quality, suggesting that different species use different features of their songs to pronounce their species name. An important point to emerge from the splicing experiments was that a lot of the song has nothing whatever to do with species identification. So what else might it be saying? Bruce Falls had the idea that song might not only announce I'm a white throated sparrow, but also I'm me. I'm this particular white-throated sparrow. So our first experiments were simply to try and demonstrate that they could, in fact, recognize different individuals. And we started by playing them their neighbors, the birds that had surrounding territories, and contrasting the response to those neighbors with the response they gave if we brought in a stranger's song from somewhere else. And we found that they responded much less to their neighbors uh, in both species, we think that this minimizes the effort that they put into territorial fighting with the neighbors. They don't have to continue to fight with the neighbors once the territories are established. So the usefulness of each bird having its own personalized song is that neighbors of the same species can get to know and accept one another's presence without constant bickering. Aggression can be reserved for strangers. But what happens when danger appears and all songbirds are in peril? Can they then communicate between species? Because moments of danger in nature occur rather at random, studying the songbirds' reactions can pose problems. One way to solve them is to take the danger with you, as Professor Peter Marler is doing with his stuffed owl. 
In the case of a mild threat, like a perched owl or an overflying crow, songbirds react by ganging up on the enemy, using a call that's quite distinct from their normal song to help recruit the necessary mob. The moaning calls have a very distinctive structure. They resemble one another and a great many species of birds. They all tend to have a very sharp, repetitive, um, rather harsh tone to them. So you'll hear these very harsh check, 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 or grrr, uh, almost machine gun-like calls from the orioles if we manage to get a response. Good. First on the scene is the bird whose territory has been violated. Yeah, the red wings are mobbing now. That's a very typical mobbing call. Check. There's an oriole coming down. This is the male. See, it's interesting that here you have two members of the same family, the oriole and the red wing. And although their songs are completely different, which is functional because, of course, they have to maintain some separation in breeding, when it comes to these mobbing calls, they're much similar, more similar to one another. Recordings of mobbing calls made by four different species show how remarkably similar they are. Not only do many species recognize and respond to them, but the sharp, repetitive sounds used in the calls are easy to locate. So a mobbing call doesn't just say help is needed, it also tells where the emergency is, as in this rare film of a crow being mobbed by red wings. Well, there is another circumstance when a hawk is overhead when a quite different kind of call is used. And I first noticed this actually years ago when I was studying chaffinches in England and uh, I would hear a, a sound which was very difficult to place. It's a very thin, high whistle which fades in gently, reaches its maximum intensity and then fades out again, lasting maybe a second. See that kind of a sound. And it has a sort of ventriloquial property. It's very hard to tell where it comes from. And as I looked into it, I discovered that a lot of species used this type of call when there was a hawk hunting overhead. Recordings of this sort of call, like the sharp mobbing calls, show a striking similarity regardless of species. In contrast to the mobbing calls though, they start and end softly and occupy a very narrow band of frequencies.